Hello, I'm Interweb Studios and today we ask doctors when was the patient right but you thought it wasn't serious. Most of the comments were patients giving their experiences, so I did my best to find the medical experts' experiences. If you want to hear patients' experiences let me know in the comments down below. Since you are there don't forget to like and subscribe. With that out of the way sit back and enjoy. Patient stated a live cockroach was in his ear. I said probably not and ate my words. Had this happened to me with a moth in my ear. They thought I was methed up. Best part about it was the reaction from the ER nurse when she stuck the scope in my ear. It was something like, ear ha. He does have a bug in there and it's alive. Zero out of ten do not recommend. A few weeks ago at work I had a gnat dive into my ear. While I was on a call with a customer. I feel like I deserve an Olympic gold medal for never letting the customer know I was basically having a seizing fit on the other end of the line. As soon as I managed to get him to hang up, I threw off my headset and let out the screams I'd been holding in the entire time. Managed to get the little ducker to fly back out, and then turned it into a grease smear on the wall, but for hours after I kept feeling little phantom legs in my ear and I kept twitching at random. I do not even want to imagine what a moth would feel like. In Zambia there are these little sweat bees they call, ubalubalulu, try saying that three times fast and if you stop for more that about five seconds in a wooded area during hot season they swarm you. They find every. Single. Orifice. Looking for moisture. When they get in your ears, nose, and eyes the contortions it threw people into was like watching someone possessed. You would have conversations with folks where everyone involved was just swatting at themselves without pause. Patient here. Told anesthesiologist that the general anesthetic was absurdly painful. He treated me like I was being a baby. He then paralyzed my lungs. His IV missed my vein and I didn't get any general. I was fully awake and suffocating while flopping around like a dying fish. Last thing I remember before I passed out was the surgeon telling the anesthesiologist that I wouldn't remember anything anyway. Wrong radiologist here, and I only have one somewhat matching moment since my field is fairly objective. When I did a rotation in pediatric radiology, we had this father coming in with his kid. The kid was about five, wouldn't eat properly and throw up a lot, and was very slim. I read their file and it stated that they were in and out of the hospital a lot for the same issue over the last half year or so, but no cause was ever found. It even said the father suspected his kid might have ingested something, but since the symptoms were so unspecific, this lead was never followed. So this time it seems they must have reinforced this suspicion pretty heavily, as they came to me for a functional fluoroscopy. First picture revealed a button battery stuck in the kid's esophagus. The father was so relieved that finally something was found, his eyes teared up. I read up on the file that the battery was removed endoscopically the same day and that there was significant inflammation of the esophagus due to leaking battery acid. Crazy to think that this dad suspected something along this line and it still took half a year to finally being looked into properly. Second not exactly matching story is from when I was in the last year at university, doing clinical internships. I was at this medical ER in a bit city with a lot of homeless people and one day, this comatose guy comes in with suspected alcohol overdose. I remember him stinking of vodka. Each time when I tried to establish peripheral vein cannula, he pulled his arms back and groaned, which resulted in me missing the shot. The fifth, sixth time trying to establish the cannula, now in one of his feet, he still pulls his legs back and I start to feel really angry. I thought, this alcoholic ass won't let me do my job properly only to block an ER room for people who are really sick, just so he can sleep out his overdose. With the help of a few other guys, we finally got a cannula and drew some blood as well. 30 minutes later, the lab results come back and he had basically no alcohol in his blood whatsoever. So we did a brain CT scan and it turns out he had a cerebral hemorrhage. This instance taught me a lot about how easy it is to misjudge people and to treat all my patients equally, even in my thoughts. My parents met when they were both teaching in a small rural town. The local doctor was notorious for diagnosing everyone with appendicitis. Headache? Must be appendicitis. Broke your toe? Appendicitis. Got a mystery rash? Have you considered getting your appendix out? 
One day the sports teacher went to see the doctor with abdominal pain. The doctor diagnosed him with indigestion and told him to go home and rest. The pain kept getting worse and worse, until eventually the teacher decided to drive an hour to the nearest hospital. Turned out his appendix had burst and the doctor completely missed his time to shine. Without going into specific a patient was brought into our ER for like. The sixth time in six months with the same thing. Fits, progressive neurological symptoms and a label of a normal MRI scan done four months earlier with a referral to a functional neurologist to basically deal with what was labeled as psychosomatic neurological symptoms. The patient had their first neurological event whilst they were on the phone, getting some bad news, having a normal MRI and having seen a neurologist who couldn't find anything wrong, again four months earlier. Thankfully, due to the patient rocking up in a wheelchair this time round as they were unable to stand, one of the senior ER doctors brought them in to do another scan. Cue me. Walking in to see a crazy neuro patient who is going to see the specialist as there is nothing wrong with them, until the very day I die, I shall never, ever forget my horror when I saw their repeat MRI scan on my computer screen just before entering the room. The patient had a golf ball sized tumor in the very back of their brain and was in huge, huge trouble with rapidly progressive neurological signs. I felt so terrible for both the patient and their family. The first thing I did was to tell them that we were very wrong, there was something physically wrong and apologized for the ten or so times they had been sent home from ER and told that they had been making up the symptoms and signs. The family were just grateful that they now knew what was going on. The patient died a month or so later. I tell this to all of my junior colleagues and I am extremely wary of how people are labeled as having a fictitious illness when they present to hospital. I had a patient in his mid-thirties establishing care with me for difficulty reading. He actually came in with his mother and was very shy, which I thought was very strange. He said he worked at a library and words would get jumbled up while reading. He had zero additional issues. I actually did a very thorough neurological exam and found zero problems. I asked him to read a magazine out loud at different speeds and he did it perfectly. I said everything looked fine and wanted to order some labs. I honestly felt he was just a strange character. They agreed to labs but mom was very pushy to do head imaging. I said we could, but I ordered the CT as routine and by the time labs came back he was extremely low on vitamin D I called saying we should replace it and hold off on the scan. Not only did mom not want the scan cancelled, she wanted an MRI and she wanted it stat. I basically got tired of trying to be reassuring and just ordered what she wanted. He had the biggest glioblastoma I have ever seen. Go mom. <coughs> Caveat. Not a doctor, I'm a medic. Saw three patients in a row who were clearly lingers, malingerers, using the military medical system to get out of work without actually being sick or injured. Patient number four comes in and says basically she doesn't have any other symptoms but her ears are kinda sore and she wanted time off work. I instantly thought, linger number four then, and was very dismissive. Had to run every cost through a medical SGT who asked me if I'd actually done a full assessment before dismissing her. Admitted no and they rightfully told me off and made me go back and do my job properly. So I returned to the patient take an actual look in her ears and to this day they were the most messed up ear canals I've ever seen. They had the bizarre scratch and cuts running down the canals and both eardrums were full of blood and swollen. I was extremely apologetic and sent her straight to the doctor for an urgent review. Taught me a valuable lesson I have never forgot about doing a full assessment on every patient, regardless of what I think about them or their symptoms. Edit. For all those asking I have no idea what was wrong with her ears. One of the downsides of working in my area is that once you pass a patient on you almost never hear about what happened after. My best guess is a sudden and intense infection that swelled her ear canals so fast the skin split, but it's just my guess. Three-year-old kid with gastro. Mother says the kid is floppy and weak but during examination he was climbing furniture and doing normal kid stuff. All objectively normal as far as it's possible to do a neuro exam on an incooperative three-year-old. Advised to encourage fluids and small frequent meals. Prescribed on Dancitron and moved on cuz it's a busy ed with ambulances lining up by the minute. 
24 hours later, he re presents completely flaccid, gets intubated, and flown to a tertiary center. Turns out there's a super rare autoimmune reaction to certain GI pathogens that causes demyelination similar to Julian Barr syndrome, and I ducking missed it. Every day, there are thousands of kids that turn up to Ed with gastro. Most of them are a bit flat cuz they're exhausted, hungry, and dehydrated. So are the parents. I can't MRI and LP every kid who presents lethargic after a bout of gastro. The number needed to treat is far greater than the number needed to harm. Medicine is largely a numbers game. We go for the most likely diagnosis, acknowledging that sometimes we will miss the occasional unicorn. That's why we tell patients to come back if something changes or gets worse. No one knows everything about medicine, and often patients turn up before their symptoms get bad enough to match the descriptions in the textbook. It's only a matter of time before you miss something bad. If it hasn't happened to you, then you haven't seen enough patients. When it does happen to you, it will burn itself into your brain forever. It will eat at you and keep you awake at night, but the only way to keep going is to find a way to persevere and learn so you never miss it again. Accept the fact that you are going to miss something again and change your practice to reflect this fact. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment if you want to see the patient side of this, as most comment in the thread were. Until next time.